All right, we're going to get started now. Thank you guys for uh, coming to this session. Um, my name is Andy Swan. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, but I, I, earlier this week, I was in Park City, Utah, and there was a blizzard, and so I'm really glad to be here right now in Orlando. Um, but I'm, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, you'll be surprised to know that I am not a world-famous jockey. <laughs> right? Uh, because they're small. But anyway, um, Louisville is the home of bourbon. And I want to start off with the story about bourbon because I like bourbon. It's from our home city. Uh, does anybody in here know of Pappy Van Winkle bourbon? Okay. This is the most famous top of the line bourbon in the world. Um, very, very rare to get. But I want to tell you a little story about it. So, Say 10 years ago when we, my wife and I built our house, we wanted to celebrate. And so I went down to the liquor store down the street and I, sit, and I just looked around. I was looking for something special, uh, something that I'd never gotten before. So I looked around behind the liquor store owner, up on a top shelf, covered in dust, was this bottle of Pappy Van Winkle 23 year bourbon. And I said, Sam, what is that? He said, Oh, so that is Pappy. I will never sell that. It's been up there for two years. I'll never get rid of it. I said, how much is it? He said, $249 for the bottle. Whoa. Okay, so I'm not going to, it's not that special, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but anyway, my wife got it for me a little later uh, for my birthday, and it was incredible. But what's really interesting about that is I went back um, this fall to that same liquor store down the street, and this is on a 40 degree October night in Louisville, Kentucky. And that is 1,024 people standing in a parking lot with a raffle ticket, hoping to win the right to buy one bottle of Pappy Van Winkle bourbon. They had 14 bottles allocated to them. 1,024 people showed up, there's food trucks, and you've got your ticket for the right to buy that $249 bourbon. So that's the shift that occurred on Main Street over a 10 year period for this product. And you'll understand why, why I get into that. This is how much people, so this, this bottom line here you can see um, is a, this is a seven or eight year period, 10 year period, same 10 year period of mentions of Pappy Van Winkle on Twitter. Okay, so you can see that when I was at the liquor store and it was covered in dust, there was about 12 mentions on Twitter that entire year. 2016, 2015 at the peak, we were getting close to 18,000 mentions per year. So you could see via social data, you could see the increase in consumer demand on Main Street. So I didn't need to go to the parking lot to see that. I could see it with this chart. And by the way, this is the price of Pappy Van Winkle, a bottle of it on the secondary market. It has gone in that same time frame from $240 collecting dust on the shelf to now, uh, right before Derby, I can probably get $2,000 or $2,500 for the bottle on the secondary market. And so I, I'm, I'm telling you this story because really this is what we do. We look for trends on Main Street before they become news on Wall Street. So uh, this is an example where we predicted um, uh, a couple companies, one was uh, Express, was going to have a very good quarter. Uh, we were able to see that using our lens of social data, which I will get into, that, that more people were uh, shopping at Express, and uh, <coughs> the stock did very well, very well on earnings. So once again, again, our mission is to track consumer behavior on Main Street. So this is Snapchat. We say, there's a user revolt going on at Snapchat because their, their um, user interface changes. So we track that behavior on Main Street via social data before it becomes news on Wall Street. And so as I get into this, you'll start to see how this plays out. Our, our most famous, the reason really why we're here, uh, our most famous call happened just this last year in the day after the Apple keynote event. Now let me see if this laser works. because that. So the day after the Apple keynote event, which is where they go out and they tell the world about their new product line, uh, the day after that, we were able to see very clearly 
that people were not interested in buying these new iPhones, right? The, uh, it was just a minor upgrade to the phones that they had done. And so we put out uh, our, bull our bearish alert on it saying, we don't think Apple's going to do well. And um, the stock fell from there. And so this is the reason, this is the data behind that. So each of these green spikes is purchase intent mentions on Twitter of people talking about, I'm going to buy a new iPhone or I'm going to buy uh, an Apple Watch, any sort of purchase intent where we can see very clearly that they are dedicated to purchasing one of Apple's products. Each of these spikes is what happens after a keynote event, right? And you can see that they had, uh, they had really strong with the uh, iPhone 6, very strong, the stock goes up. iPhone 6S, not a good keynote, the stock goes down for the next nine months. iPhone 7, much better than the last year, stock goes up. iPhone 8, iPhone X, much better, huge, stock goes up to 225, but that's, but right then, the day after the keynote is when we sent that bearish alert because it was literally half of the purchase intent volume. The day after the keynote event, we were able to see that Apple was going to have uh, some trouble, and that's why we put out that alert. That big drop is why we put out that alert on Apple saying, Get out of Apple or short it or buy puts, or if you're like my brother, you buy way out of the money puts and just go crazy on this stuff. Uh, and the stock fell, fell from uh, 225, I think, uh, to uh, 143. We actually, we actually uh, we've seen purchase intent recover on Apple, just in case you guys are worried about Apple, uh, or if you're holding it. We actually saw it recover uh, to normalized levels, so they're just kind of getting into to normalized levels. We put out um, the stock had fallen too far, I think at 145, something like that, uh, bullish alert, and we've been, uh, and continue to be bullish uh, on Apple. So how do we do, how do we gather this data, this incredible insights into consumer behavior? It's really um, quite complicated, um, but I'll try to make it simple. So over the course of two or three years, and still ongoing, before we could ever create signal, before we could ever ingest data, we had to develop a map that shows us every brand and product that are owned by these publicly traded companies. And so when we did that, it, it took a very long time. Megan there is in charge of that process. Um, and, and here's why it takes so long and why it's so difficult. These are all of Apple's brands as of J July of last year, something like that. So a lot of brands. Then if you dig down and say, okay, that's interesting, but I really want to know how people talk about them in real life. This is all the keywords that we search for and that we match against for just the Apple Watch. And so you can see there's some things on there like three rings, my three rings goal, uh, exercise ring on my, it doesn't even have to mention the Apple Watch, but we know when they say those things, they're talking about the Apple Watch. So that's our list of keywords. You take that times 299 companies, overall we're covering 6,900 brands, and uh, I think it's over 140,000 keywords that we're tracking right now. Um, that number's a little higher, I think it's 305. Uh, consumer facing companies, mostly in the S&P 500. Uh, that's our coverage list, and the way then that we get this data, we have the map, we have the kind of Rosetta Stone that tells us what matters when people talk about things, and then we have a partnership direct with Twitter where uh, we're one of three or four companies in finance that has this direct partnership with Twitter where we literally get every single tweet that goes through their system and match it up against these keywords. We match it up against these keywords like this. So Bob Johnson, you know, puts this out, this kind of innocuous, you know, uh, normal sounding tweet, bought some ugly yet comfy and functional sketchers for work, okay? He tweets that, it comes into our system and we analyze it. We analyze it for three things. Purchase intent, which is the primary one, which means he has uh, shown an intent to purchase in the near future or in the recent past has purchased this item. That's clear with bought. Uh, we also look for sentiment in two ways, positive or negative. In this case, he has both. Um, they're ugly. So that's negative, but they're comfy and functional, so that's positive. We do that for every tweet that goes through Twitter, 
I think it's something like 170 of them per second that we analyze this way. And then we're able to come up with our three key metrics that we push out then to investors. And our primary business is to sell this data to hedge funds and quant funds. Uh, the reason that we're here and the reason that we do this uh, stuff for the individual investors is because my brother and I, Landon, have been in this business for 20 years. Um, we have always been focused on the individual investor. We sold our last company to TD Ameritrade. It's what we love to do and we love to talk to people and show them what's going on. And so we put out these three uh, metrics. Brand mentioned volume is first. That is just how much are people talking about this? How much are people talking about this brand or company? And that can be really great on product launches. That can be really great on marketing campaigns uh, to see the effectiveness of a Super Bowl ad uh, and, and things like that. Consumer happiness is what I was talking about, sentiment, where you are either, sometimes people are very excited about a product, which I'll, uh, and, and other times they're very negative on a product. And I'll show you an example of that where that can uh, really lead uh, the pack in terms of uh, the stock movement. But our most important by far is purchase intent. When people have indicated on Twitter that they are buying or selling something, and you take that in and you get 300, 400, 4,000, 10,000 of those mentions every month, you have a really significant sample size and you can really see how things are changing for the company on Main Street before it becomes news on Wall Street. Um, we've had our data studied extensively by two universities. The first was Georgetown University, McDonough School of Business. They came to us and wanted to do a study on this because they're very interested in the impact of uh, social media on brands and, and how you can track these things. And uh, this was a really long process. I think it took 18 months of some serious, serious uh, data digging and uh, statistical analysis on their part and ours. But this is the big takeaway quote that we love uh, that helps us uh, do so well with uh, hedge funds and so on is that um, this data, purchase intent data, once aggregated at the firm level by Likefolio, is predictive of both upcoming sales and the unexpected component of sales growth. And that's really the key phrase, the unexpected component of sales growth, because that's where your alpha comes from. That's your advantage. That's saying what analysts have missed, okay? Um, Rutgers did a study as well, um, very intense. I think that one took uh, eight months. Like folio power data sets produce superior sales predictions. And so that's really what we're trying to do is understand at the top line revenue level what has changed for the positive or for the negative for this company. Classic example here, Weight Watchers. Now, this is a really, you guys are intelligent, driven. I, I bet someone in this room can tell me over the seven year, six year period there, what the green line is purchase intent mentions. What's happening on every one of those spikes? You're getting ahead of me, you're getting ahead of me, but what's happening every year, the annual spikes? New Year's resolutions, right? This is the year I'm gonna lose weight and I'm gonna join Weight Watchers. I'm gonna subscribe to Weight Watchers. That's happening year over year over year. Unfortunately for Weight Watchers for a long period of time, that was on the decline. And you can see it in our data. You can see it in the red line, which is the stock price. Weight Watchers had less and less people signing up for their service as uh, during that very important time of year that essentially drives their revenue for the full year because it's a su subscription business. So they had less and less of that going on. Now you're way ahead of me. The big spike, Oprah. Oprah gets involved with the company. Um, she comes in and you can see purchase intent mentions uh, spike to levels that we uh, had really never seen before. The stock got a nice pop off of that. We did not put out any alert on that because it's really difficult to tell, you know, if this influencer pop or if it was the, the news of the day was going to sustain uh, over the next uh, little while. So we waited until the next year, and that's when we saw uh, purchase intent mentions on New Year's, for New Year's resolutions actually increase year over year compared to that non oprah year for the first time in a very long time. Uh, in, in many years, and the stock had already run up to about 24, 25 bucks at that point. Uh, but when we saw that, we knew that the turnaround in Weight Watchers was real, and we were able to get in uh, before 
really analysts in Wall Street caught on to that. I think the stock got well over 100 bucks. Now it's fallen back down. But that was just a classic uh, example of how you can, we can use this purchase intent data to examine and understand and predict a company turnaround. Um, so how do we deliver this data? And don't worry, I'm going to get into some cool trade examples for you guys, too, that you can just write down um, at near the end. But uh, here's how we deliver it. So every week, our most popular product um, for individual investors is what we call a like Folio Sunday earnings sheet. Uh, earnings season's about 10 weeks long out of every quarter. Um, and every Sunday, we send out our Sunday earnings sheet that has all of the companies that we cover that are going to report earnings that upcoming week and at what our data is saying is likely to happen on that earnings call, good or bad. So it really breaks down like this. Let me see if, yeah. Really breaks down like this. I know it's tough to read. If you come by our um, booth, booth 420, um, we've got a really, uh, we've got it blown up really nice and we can show you samples. But essentially what it is, okay, these are all of Mondays. This was um, last week's. So. Uh, week three of earnings season, it went out on uh, January 28th. So this is all of Monday's stocks in here. Um, we've got our historical confidence uh, down that row, which is really important to us because what it does is it, it makes very transparent how good or how bad our data has been for that stock. We consider ourselves more of a data company and more of statisticians than we do stock signalers. So we want to be very transparent that on uh, some of these stocks, for example, Verizon, uh, we have a historical earnings confidence of zero, so you should probably stay away from that. Or for um, Hawaiian Air, we had a, um, this on uh, Tuesday of last week, we had a very strong conviction. We have a 10.0 history with it, and we saw that the stock uh, was um, really going to have uh, trouble going into this earnings season because of the massive drop we saw in uh, year over year uh, purchase intent and they did the stock fell I think eight percent really nice trade um, but this Sunday sheet goes out every every week and covers the week ahead and there's three things that I think are you know if you're going to take away from this as you go if you're thinking about earnings or just trading in general um, the first is when you're looking at our purchase intent data. Uh, the first question I always ask myself is, is this shift larger than you would normally expect given the seasonality of the underlying business? So that uh, helps you avoid a situation where you see purchase intent going through the roof for Weight Watchers in January and you think, wow, something really great is going on there. No, it happens every, it happens every January, so you've got to be careful of seasonality. The second is this shift in consumer behavior sustained? Are we seeing the same thing year over year, quarter after quarter? And so when I look at a stock long term, that's really what I'm looking at. I want to see purchase intent mentions doing the opposite of what I saw in that Weight Watchers chart where I want to see them going up quarter after quarter, year after year. I want it to be sustained. And the third is, and most important, is is the shift larger than what stock, the stock suggests um, Wall Street is expecting? So. We don't care what analysts expect. Uh, we think that's the wrong way to think about things. We care what the stock is saying the whole market expects. And so if the stock is up 25% going into an earnings call, and we see purchase intent data that's flat or just slightly up on a year-over-year -year basis, we're going to be pretty bearish on that because we're not trying to predict the exact revenue number. What we are saying is, Wall Street is way ahead of itself here. Uh, purchase intent data is not matching up with what's going on with the stock. We also have a really cool dashboard. This is what um, hedge funds pay us $10,000, a year for access into this, where you can log in, like Folio, log into this dashboard and see these metrics over time. And so this one's really cool. This is Snapchat. This is what I was talking about with consumer happiness. So this is from the Lightfolio dashboard. You've typed in Snap. You want to look at consumer happiness mentions. And this massive drop right here from 60% of users, Snapchat users being happy, to 
I think it got under 20% of users being happy over the course of a two or three day period. Uh, that was when Snapchat rolled out its new user interface about a year ago. Uh, the stock was at 20 bucks, I think, at the time. Uh, but what we were able to see from this massive drop and the huge increase in mentions simultaneous is that users were essentially abandoning the platform never to return. Uh, I think the stock got down to about six bucks over the last year. They finally are starting to show some signs of uh, stabilizing and we're actually starting to see some uh, growth in our metrics now. Uh, but that was how uh, you know, consumer happiness kind of drove that stock. And you can see that in the Likefolio dashboard. Uh, next example, purchase intent mentions on a quarter over quarter basis. This one's really cool. I just put this in this because it's so unbelievably cool. But these, the green bars are Likefolio purchase intent mentions for Square, the payment system. And really that's saying how many people are talking about installing Square and using it for their small business, right? And we track that over time. These are the green bars. Uh, quarterly, but you can see right after they went public this unbelievable growth up in terms of uh, people using Square. And so the stock tracked with it really well, um, like kind of oddly well, but um, that's what's going on in the Likefolio dashboard. It's really cool interface for just being able to dig in when you're looking at a stock and say, all right, I think I'm going to be bullish on, let's say, Tesla. I think I'm going to be bullish on Tesla. Uh, the numbers look great. I like the technicals. I'm going to go over to Likefolio and check it out and make sure that there's nothing going very wrong on Main Street with Tesla consumers. And so that, that's what um, the Likefolio dashboard is there for. We also, um, due to popular demand, um, we have partnerships with a lot of investment advisors and they wanted this. And so we, we built it and uh, you guys have access to it called our tactical model which is essentially 12 to 20 stocks that we think, based on our data, are significantly undervalued and that are going to outperform Wall Street expectations from a revenue standpoint over the next 12 months or more. Um, we, it's a long only tactical model. Um, it, it's equal weight. Uh, there's, there's updates monthly and uh, it's, it's designed for the aggressive portion of people's portfolios. Um, the risk number on it is 84. Uh, that's, a ri that's from the company Riskalyze. They analyze it. That's on a zero to 100 scale. So you can tell it's a high risk, aggressive uh, type of model. And there's 12 stocks there. Um, that's uh, our first year performance ending in June was fantastic. I think we're 700 basis points uh, outperforming the market. The market was up 12% during that time. Um, there you can see some of the Weight Watchers was our, um, was our biggest winner and Expedia was our biggest loser. Um, the model has performed pretty well uh, since then. It, of course, got hit in um, November and December, just like every other stock, but it's bounced back really nicely. And I believe it's currently outperforming the market in this year as well uh, by a significant amount. Uh, the other cool thing about this tactical model is um, every single company that we have in there, we give a full social media analysis of that company so that you understand the why behind the reasoning of why we put that stock into the uh, tactical model. So every stock has its own page. Um, so there's, if there's 15 positions, there's 15 pages, they get updated monthly. It's a really cool um, service. So this is a, a great testimonial, our, our clients I uh, love it, and we love um, getting that kind of feedback from people who say, look, I, w I really wanted to become a, a uh, full-time trader, and they were able to do so. Um, so now I'll go through some trade ideas with you guys, uh, and at the end, I'll be able to answer questions, but we've got some cool uh, trade ideas that I think uh, you guys will enjoy. So uh, if anybody wants to shout out guesses, you can. Um, can you guess which $55 stock is headed lower, and the, um, the reason that we think this stock is headed lower is because you can see it's very seasonal. This is purchase intent mentions on a 90 day moving average. You can see it's very seasonal year, year, year. And you can see this growth that was happening should be, you'd expect it to be up here if they'd maintained this growth cycle, this growth level, 
but instead it's down here. Uh, and that made us bearish on the stock. Can you guess what that stock is that's super seasonal but might be having trouble right now? This is Canada Goose, the, the maker. Yeah, good guess. I like that. Um, the the, the uh, makers of the really, really expensive, very high quality coats and jackets. Um, you know, we're finally seeing that that adoption fad on the consumer uh, level has waned. And we think that the stock, uh, we knew it was ahead of itself at 70. We still think in the high 50s it's ahead of itself and could be uh, on the way uh, down. So that's Canada Goose. The next. Unfortunately, it's another negative one. I'll have some positive ones. So can you guess which $25 clothing company just had a terrible Q4 in land? Have they reported yet? Has not reported yet. So this is one you know you can take a look at. Um, but you can see these are their, their fourth quarter. So we always try to look year over year. We think year over year is by far uh, the best example. And this is their quarter, fourth quarters over the last three years. They went flat one year, and then now it's just a steady decline. The stock's at uh, 25 bucks, uh, down from a highs near 60 a few years ago. Any guesses on what clothing companies? Macy's. Macy's. But I like those guesses. Those are good. I, in fact, I just talked about it. I know it was a really good guess uh, because we do see that same thing happening with Under Armour there. Uh, in fact, I was just on uh, TV today talking about Under Armour and the, the bearish um, outlook that we have for that company and it's cool because we can look at this data and we can see why people are turning against Under Armour and it's all about the shoes. Uh, the shoes that they make, they make shoes that are supposed to be for exercising and they hurt people's feet and they hurt kids feet and they're just losing the battle against Nike in a big way and I think they probably uh, regret getting into the shoe business but uh, that's Under Armour. Uh, next, um, $90 stock and we think they're about to blow out earnings. Um, you can see this is again on a year over year basis and now we're seeing just this incredible uh, spike and this type of spike to uh, really all time highs. Any guesses on that? My robot. And actually we put this slide together earlier this week. This one's already, uh, they, they reported on Wednesday Tuesday or Wednesday, they already reported, uh, I think the stock was up 10% uh, on the news. They reported a great number, but we still think there's room to run for IRO. I mean, this, this type of uh, trajectory is really impressive, and they have these huge holiday uh, quarters because uh, people buy each other Roombas as gifts. And uh, I don't know if that many people really buy themselves Roombas, but it seems to be a really popular gift. Uh, and I think they're getting into the self or the uh, uh, they're starting to build Roombas for lawns for lawn mowing, which uh, you know could be extremely exciting, right? Uh, I think I see all the guys and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm buying that, I'm buying that, yeah, me too. Um, so that's uh, iRobot, but that was a fantastic call we had out on our Sunday earnings sheet this week, but we also still think has uh, quite a bit of room to move. I think I heard this company guessed earlier, so that's the pool of guesses, but this stock, $27, it's a retailer, and it's on a multi-year downtrend, year after year after year after year. You can see the purchase intent mentions drop, 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 drop. The stock drop, 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 drop. The, the stock now is kind of based out, but we're starting to see, finally, just a slight recovery in terms of year-over-year -year purchase intent mentions. Just a little bit, but when you're in a funk like this, all of a sudden going sideways is pretty good news, right? That's really good news. And the stock's at 27 bucks. Anybody got a guess on who that might be? I think you might have guessed it earlier. Limited Brands, Limited Brands, that's right. Um, so we're, we're bullish on Limited Brands um, on a longer term basis. And in fact, it may make it into our next update of the tactical model because of that. Because any, just like Weight Watchers, it's actually not as pronounced as Weight Watchers, but if you remember, Weight Watchers was doing this same thing. Then Oprah came along and it went crazy. But anytime you can get out of a funk like that and just go sideways, then that's pretty good news. So we think limited brands could outperform over the next year. And next year's fourth quarter, we'd like to see you know some significant gains. And uh, that's how we would stay long on uh, limited brands. And 
Ooh, okay, this one's fun. $155 stock, about to disappoint Wall Street. And you can see why. This is our purchase intent mentions again. I mean, you had a nice steady thing going on there, and then we just saw a really nasty uh, dive. $155 stock, any guesses? Salesforce, right? And what's really interesting about this is you've got purchase intent mentions falling so hard and so fast, the stock has gone up with everything else in January. And so that's what we call a divergence play. Those a divergence opportunity, those are our favorite types of opportunities. When Wall Street has the stock going one way and our purchase intent data is showing that exactly the opposite is occurring on Main Street, that's when we start to get uh, really excited. I know Landon, uh, Landon and I, when we find uh, divergence opportunities, we go crazy. I think this might be the last one. $88 is a jeweler, and we think it's about to surprise Wall Street to the upside, because you can see the stock has just cratered. Uh, but purchase intent mentions, you know, they've been very disappointing down here for a long time, but now we're starting to see uh, that year-over-year -year growth. That is um, Tiffany's. Tiffany's, a little, uh, a little potential comeback uh, for Tiffany's, which just has been, uh, just, it's been a terrible uh, last few months or last year for Tiffany's, up around 140. Now it's uh, just barely under 100. We think uh, Tiffany's is going to post a good quarter uh, coming up. Oh, no, we got one more. Uh, $56 sports retailer. That's about to beat earnings. So it's going to put out a good earnings report because it was on a downtrend year over year. Now we're here. Uh, anybody got a guess? Bass Pro Shop? Foot Locker. Um, Bass Pro Shops was interesting, though. Um, they have really benefited, I think, from the uh, decline of dicks, right? Um, the, the, some of the, a, a lot of these political type scandals blow over really quickly. They're not very effective most of the time. The difference with dicks, they got involved in some sort of um, gun, uh, what guns they were going to sell, and they offended um, a, a large portion of the consumer base. Uh, by the way that they handled that. And a lot of them in our data is showing that a lot of them have left that company for good. And, and Bass Pro Shops is one of the um, beneficiaries of that. Oh, wow, I put a lot of these on it. What is, I mean, you guys are never going to sign up for like, give all this away. Um, but anyway, uh, $335 service provider, all time high purchase intent. Um, uh, there may only be one $335 stock. That's Netflix, right? Um, and, and this, what, we, what, what drove this was that um, the, the movie with Sandra Bullock that had a blindfold on, what was it? Bird Box. Bird Box, unbelievable hit. I mean, the amount of tweets that we saw come through on that uh, was very good. And then also I think it was um, Bandersnatch was this choose your own adventure really cool uh, uh, show that they put out. Uh, on their own and the response to that was so incredible and what was so genius about it when we looked at the data come in it was unbelievable timing because it was right at the end of December that they did both of those back to back and what normally we see in like folio data and then later in the uh, company's earnings reports what normally we see is that at the beginning of January people cancel these subscription services a lot again going back to the New Year's resolution type of thing so they sit down and they say, all right, I'm going to clean up my credit card bill. And then they get it out and they cancel the things that they're not using. But so Netflix, I believe, was very proactive about that, putting out two huge original content pieces in a one-week period right before the turn of the new year. And our data supports that it was, a f it was effective. People are not canceling Netflix, and they're getting a lot more people to sign up for the service. The noise from the, yes, there is noise from every time a company does a price increase. Uh, what we saw with Netflix, I believe, Megan, you can, you can uh, chime in if I'm wrong here, but what we saw is really just people kind of saying, all right, I'm, I'm going to pay more for Netflix. I mean, it was like, I, I think now it's what, 12 or 13 bucks? I don't know. It's not hitting a real pain point for people at, at any stretch. We actually think one of the reasons we would be bullish on Netflix is because exactly that. We look at that data when there's a price increase. 
They seem very accepting. There's not much outcry of pain. We think Netflix actually has room to move prices up and will continue to do so. We think that probably in two years we'll be paying 19.95 or uh, or so for Netflix, and that just uh, adds to their um, that adds to to what they're doing. So I want to tell you about our, our membership real quick. Um, you get the the earnings predictions every um, Sunday. Uh, the earnings sheet is my favorite thing in the world. Lane and I literally print them off, have them at our desk. It's like sitting at the racetrack with the tip sheet, and it is awesome. I mean, it is awesome. I love it. I love it. I trade it like crazy. Lane and I trade it. Um, sometimes we don't get, Megan gets frustrated with us because we don't get any work done because we're busy trading off the earnings sheet. Uh, but we're, you know, we, we love it. Um, you also get, uh, full access to the research dashboard at uh, Lifefolio that I showed you. Um, our tact sorry, let me see if I can go back. Our uh, tactical model, um, which goes out monthly, that's that 12 to 15 stocks. And you know, quite frankly, it's unbelievable savings versus hedge fund clients. I mean, uh, to, to give you guys an idea of what is going on, 95, 94% of our revenue comes from institutions, okay? Um, it does not come from uh, retail investors. And so this is massive savings. Most of them are paying uh, five figures. Some are paying six figures. Um, you can see, you know, five to 15,000 uh, a year. Some are, sometimes we sell for a lot higher than that. Our normal pricing, if you go on our website right now, it's around $1,200 a year. Um, and normally our season pass is $199. But at the show, only at the show, because you came and saw me in person, and I got an ego boost out of it. Uh, we're, good, we, we, um, we're offering so that you're going to save 50% uh, for life on every billing that Lifefolio ever does. Uh, you know, you, you, that will stick with you forever, guaranteed to never increase. So the price there, if you go to the annual membership, will be uh, annualized 49 bucks a month. It's a little under $600 for the year. And we're offering here at the show a season pass, which is three months of uh, full like folio uh, trader membership. Instead of 199, we're doing it at 49 bucks. We just wanna get you guys involved in this, let you see it work for three months before it converts over to the annual at that uh, discounted rate and just check it out because we think, we really think it's the best uh, thing since sliced bread and we're very proud of it and we wanna have uh, as many of you on the service as possible, uh, kicking the tires with us and telling us what you think. So uh, with that, um, you, can, you can, to do that, these two ladies right here will, uh, will help you out with that or come to our booth or go to likefolio.com slash Orlando and uh, that will get you, expires Sunday night, so you gotta do it by Sunday night, but that will get you the 50% off for life on the baseline and the super cheap uh, introductory offer. So if anybody has any questions, uh, happy to answer them. Yes, in the red. Our data on Chipotle, yes, it did. In fact, our Sunday earnings sheet, we were bearish on Chipotle. So we got, and Chipotle went up, I think, 10%. So we got, that was one we got wrong. We get about 65%, um, somewhere in there, are right, and 35% are wrong. And generally speaking, our winners are bigger than our losers. But this is not a golden goose. It does not work every time. It's around a 65% hit rate, which if you're you know, a trader like us, that's fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, your prediction on trade is awesome. Yep, so me too. Your prediction for these stocks that you mentioned, uh, you call how long? A month, two months, six months? Great. Options? Yeah, great question. The way that, um, for options, the question is around options and the duration of the signal that we're putting out. So when you're talking about the earnings sheet, that's literally for that week. I mean, it's, it, we're talking about, I'm gonna hold an options position for two or three days, period. Weekly up, Weekly up. yeah, fine. Um, you know, what Lane and I normally do is we actually, I normally don't trade weeklies because a lot of times there's liquidity issues with those, but I'll usually go one or two months out and so sometimes if we're bullish on a stock, I may sell a, a put spread underneath of it or I may buy a call spread way above it depending on how aggressive I'm gonna be, but it's a very short time frame that I'm gonna be holding that. Uh, when, it, when it's the tactical model, 
that's a longer term hold. So that's, that's actually more like a portfolio. Uh, but the earnings sheets and active trading style, it's, it's less than a one week hold. So which is the strongest result? Tactical model? The tactical model is like a port, it's a longer term. You're gonna hold for it probably at least a year on each of those positions, but the earnings sheet is for that week and that week only. Sir? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Landon, can you, Landon's, uh, he, he does all of this analysis for, he's back, he, that's my little brother. Uh, he, he does all this analysis for, um, statistically for the hedge funds and stuff that we sell to. So can you talk about how, first of all, not only how it's improved, but how we do that, what the process is to do that. And we've got, a, um, we've got a full white paper, statistical white paper that we did. It's available at our booth if you want to take a look at it, or we can email a copy of it to you. It's very in-depth. Yep. Anybody else? We've got time for one more. Yep. If you're following a, a Wonder Armor, is there, have you seen any correlation between the golfer's speed and the price of the stock? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I don't think, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that there's much there. Uh, I know that Steph Curry has added a lot for Under Armour because he has his own line of shoes. I think The Rock now, Dwayne Johnson now has his own line of shoes through Under Armour. So they're big on the celebrity endorsement. They, they're betting a lot on that. Uh, Jordan Spieth's impact, I would have to actually dig into the data to look at that. But um, overall, I don't think much is going that well for Under Armour right now. All right, guys, I want to thank you all. We're at uh, booth 420. I'll be around if you want to chat. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much.